Hi folks, and welcome back to Dungeons & Dry Brushing. My name's Daniel, and today we're going to build some Roman fantasy hovels. Places for the commoners to live. I was recently looking at my collection of buildings for my next campaign, and I realized that they're all kind of upper class in what's supposed to be a pretty poor city, actually. So, I need to move on and make some buildings for the common folk, the poor folk of the realm, you know, the people who do all the real work, to live in. The main stipulation to this is that I wanted to spend no money. No money at all, if possible. Uh, someone in my comments had recently mentioned that they've been using boxes as buildings, which I think is actually something that's kind of a, a throwback to a lot of our childhoods, probably. You know, the first games of D&D you played, or, or the first war games you played, where you just kind of plunked some household objects down on the table and said, that's a barracks, that's a truck, that's a destroyed tank, whatever it was, and you just, that became your playground, your battleground for your miniatures. And I kind of dig the idea, both as a throwback and as a way to make some D&D terrain at very low cost. Now I should warn you, I have not done this before, I've never tried to do this before. This is going to be my first shot at it on camera. But my first three shots, actually. I've got three different ideas of how to build these hovels out of different materials using different techniques. And I'm going to give them all a shot, see what lands. Whichever one looks best, I'll probably make a couple more of them to flesh out the city. Let's get started. So this is the first box I'm going to be working with, saved at the last minute from the recycling bin. I'm using boxes made of thicker material for this, rather than just, say, Amazon boxes. Mostly for reasons of structural integrity. I just feel like these will hold up better. I also have some 3D printed details doors and window frames. There are a lot of alternatives to this if you don't have a 3D printer though. They can be purchased online somewhere like Etsy, they can be handcrafted from foam, or there are laser cut MDF or even Lego building pieces that are popular alternatives. On the first building I tried to inset the door, which is kind of a mistake, but I'm going to be making lots of mistakes here so it won't be the only one. To bond resin and cardboard together, I decide on hot glue. The only thing I'm really sure can actually get the job done. I used a ruler as a rough guide for placing the windows. This doesn't have to be exact, but I wanted to make sure that the heights were relatively even for both window frames. The next step is a rooftop balcony. This is both to add some playability as well as break up the boxy look a little bit. I have a big stash of wooden bits and pieces hanging around, including a bunch of coffee stirrers, so those became fodder for the balcony. The glue of choice here is simple PVA. I apply it generously, not really worrying about it being too much. There's really no such thing. Then I just start laying down the coffee stirrers. I make sure they're flush with the edge of the box and with each other. They will tend to move a bit because the PVA doesn't have much grip, so I just keep an eye on it and correct them as I go along. Here is part of the stash in question, a bag of wooden trinkets I found at a secondhand store recently. I pull a few random bits from it to add some detail to the balcony. I'm not really sure what these are, maybe pieces from an old board game? but I separate the top rounded parts from the cylinder since I intend to use all of those pieces separately. This takes a bit of work, but using wooden bits usually does. I chose tacky glue for this, but hot glue would probably have been the smarter choice here. I place the rounded tops near the roof of the building like they are the exposed ends of support beams.
Once the PVA glue on the rooftop balcony is dried, I take some old clippers and snip off the ends of the coffee stirrers to bring them flush with the sides of the box. Personally, I find doing it this way a lot easier than trying to cut the stirrers to length ahead of time. Once it's completely trimmed, I use hot glue to add some more coffee stirrers as girding to finish off the sides and give it a cleaner look overall. This helps to make the structure look more intentional, something that was purposefully constructed rather than just random pieces I threw together. And now it's time to use the posts that we cut off too. I add these to the top of the balcony as the start of a safety fence around the outside. The ones I don't use go back in the bag. I'll find some other purpose for those later. From there, I take some more coffee stirrers and they get used for fence rails. Since this is supposed to be kind of a broken down old building, I make sure to break some and even keep one missing. This also adds gameplay elements, since some sides of the building will have partial cover and some won't. And finally comes the last step in the structure. I use some match sticks to construct a hatch for the rooftop access. I put this together with tacky glue and just kind of keep adding to it until it looks the right size to me. At that point, I add an old jewelry ring as a handle and tacky glue the structure into the back corner of the balcony. Before I leave all of this glue to dry though, it's time for texture. For this first building, I'm going to use my old standby of Galleria Sand Texture Gel. This is the same technique I used on MDF in a previous video. I use an old brush and just apply the texture gel thinly to all of the flat surfaces of the box. This is going to do a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to making this look like, well like it's not a box. Just take your time and make sure not to get the gel on any wooden or resin elements or other things you might be using in your own builds. Once the box is completely covered, I finally leave the first building and all of that glue and texture gel to dry. Okay, so the structure for the first building is finished and I've got the texture paint on there, but that's gonna take a while to dry. So rather than wait on it, I'm gonna set that aside and move on to doing the structure on the other two buildings. That way we can make them all at once and paint them all at once and save ourselves a little time and trouble. The next one starts out with some of the same basic steps, slotting in the doors and windows. Now I didn't inset the windows on the last building and I think that was a mistake. So I'm going to inset the windows on the next building the same way we did the door. That said, I am way less certain about the thing that I'm going to use to texture the next one. It's kind of up in the air whether it's even going to work or not, but uh, only one way to find out. I start building number two more or less the same way. Instead of fully insetting the windows though, I trace a line around the inside cutout and remove that from the box. So I'll be gluing the window frames flat to the surface of the box. In the end, I feel like this is the way that turned out the best, and I use it for both the doors and windows on the final building. But other than that, they get placed the same way. I decided that I wanted a peaked tiled roof for this building, so I got out some cheap dollar store foam and did some rough measurements just using the edge of the box. Now this doesn't have to be perfect, it's, it's a hovel after all, so if it looks a little broken down or out of shape, that's perfectly fine. I find the middle point of the box and create a rough triangle. 
Once that's cut from the foam, I use that triangle as a guide to cut a second matching one for the other side. These will serve as a basic frame to support the rest of the roof structure. For the texture on these pieces, I get out my trusty wire brush and add some worn looking wood grain to them. You want to be controlled when doing this. The harder you push, the deeper the wood grain is going to look. But on these cheaper foams, there's always the chance of shredding the material too. They don't hold up as well as pink XPS foam. To add the details of planks, I use the ruler and a cheap ballpoint pen to draw some deep lines in the foam, and then it's hot glue to add them to the top of the box. From there, the rest of the structure is going to be made from an old cereal box. The type of cardstock that food boxes are often made from is great for adding structure to these kinds of builds, and it's usually very readily available. I just use the building itself to measure the size of the pieces I need, and it's back to hot glue to stick them into place. Once the basic structure of the rooftop is done, I turn to corrugated cardstock to mimic Mediterranean style rooftops. It's not perfect, but it's the best and simplest solution I've found for it. I cut the corrugated card into thin strips and glue them onto the roof in layers, starting at the bottom and working up toward the peak of the roof. The overlap of each layer doesn't have to be too precise. Just eyeball it. That's not the kind of thing worth spending too much effort on, and it's definitely not worth that effort when you have three buildings to put together. There is a small hole on one side of the box as well. Because of how I eventually plan to texture it, this isn't very important. But I do want to cover it up, so I just cut out a small piece of construction paper and glue it over the hole. It's not a big deal for this building, but you want to watch out for things like that and how they might affect your own builds. After looking at the building, I decided that I wanted the doorway of this one to look different from the other one too. To that end, I took a toothpick and cut off the ends, sizing it to fit across the top of the door like a curtain rod. I took a wet piece of paper towel and folded it to fit across the door frame, looping it over the curtain rod. The whole thing gets super glued into place, and then I just brush some watered down PVA glue over the paper towel. That's going to be a privacy curtain. It doesn't just add some variation and detail to the structure, but when it comes time to paint it, it's also going to give us a place to add a bright contrasting color. I get out some XPS foam and mill down a couple of simple planks too. This is to disguise the places on the side where the box transitions to foam and to make it look more purposeful. These get the same wire brush texture as the other foam pieces. I glue them to the sides with tacky glue, but then I also use a toothpick to poke some holes in the ends, making it look like they're nailed in place. These kinds of small details are what really help a build to stand out and to look real and lived in. The last step here would normally be texture, but I have to do that as almost the very last step on this particular build. So now I set this one aside and move to building number three. Building three is an exciting one for me. This technique is an idea I've had in my head for a while, but I've just never gotten around to trying it. I picked out a nice big Christmas gift box for this one. Of course, that bright red ribbon has to come off, but that's no problem, and the lid gets set aside. I don't need it here, but I do have ideas for what I might use it for in the future. I swear, getting views on YouTube is the only thing that keeps me from clinically being considered a hoarder. I've already learned from my previous two builds, so this time I simply trace and cut out the negative space for the door and window frames. I don't inset them. But I also don't glue them on yet either since I'm going to be adding multiple layers of foam to the outside of this build. 
I have these sheets of white foam laying around and they're about the perfect size for this. I traced the outline of the building on with a pen and then once all of the pieces are marked, moved it over to my hot wire cutter to actually cut the shapes. I also very, very carefully used the cutter to split each piece in two widthwise. Because I'm going to be layering foam, I need the pieces to be pretty thin, and I also need them to be the same dimensions as one another. With all of my pieces laid out, I use a 3D printed texture roller to get a stone pattern on the sheets I'm using for the substructure of the building. To my surprise, this white foam, which I've never used before, actually takes the texture incredibly well. I was really surprised by this. I'm going to have to figure out what this foam is exactly and where I can get more because it takes textures beautifully. If you haven't used a texture roller before, it's really simple. You're just pushing down and slowly rolling it forward, doing your best to keep a relatively straight line. It definitely beats etching all of these stones in by hand, but that is an option. With that done, the stone texture sheets get glued to every side of the building. I turn back to tacky glue for this, and I use a very generous amount. Because I want to keep working right away though, I also add a dab of hot glue in each corner so that it will hold immediately. And once all of the stone sections are glued on, it looks like this. Of course, then I have to cut the hole for the door and the first layer of foam too. You don't want to forget that part. Now it's time for the facing or outer layers of the structure. I want these to look really old, decaying, and uncared for, so I start tracing and cutting out holes in all of the second layer of foam. I really want this building to look like its best days are well behind it. I just trace all of this on with a pen, and then came in with a knife to cut the holes. I use a sharp blade for this and make multiple passes if you have to. That said, clean cuts are not actually super important when you want something to look beat up anyway. At this step I also make sure to very roughly bevel all of the edges too, just to give it a more natural look. When it's done and glued in place, it should look something a bit like this, but, but you know, glued in place. Once the glue is dry, I use a classic method for texture and find out that this white foam takes to this wonderfully as well. It's just an old tinfoil ball rolled across the surface. Of course, this would have been way easier to do if I had done it before gluing the foam onto the box. Don't worry, I do that for the rest of the project. With all of those in place, it's time to do something about the gaps left at the corners. So I take some of my foam cutoffs and my wire cutter, and I carve out some thick, chunky foam supports. This is going to give us some more texture, more variation, and also be the support for our roof. Naturally, these get the wire brush wood texture again. Once all of these are glued in place, it's time to measure the rooftop panel. This is as simple as it gets, just place the building on the foam, trace, and cut. I want to give this building another rooftop balcony, sort of like the first building, so it's straight back to the wire brush to go over the surface of the whole panel. It takes a while, but the texture is worth it. Of course, when you're doing something like this, you want to make sure to get the sides of the foam, too. The next step is to draw in some planks. This is the same method as earlier, using the thickness of the ruler to measure some large boards. These can be traced in with a pen if you put enough pressure on it. I also draw some lines in for the ends of the planks, making sure to stagger where the planks end on each row. This makes it look more deliberate and realistic, and just adds some more visual variety as well. And just like before, I take a toothpick and use it to make some nail holes at the ends of each plank. 
Just like last time, when you're working with foam this thick, make sure to carry all relevant textures onto the sides of the piece as well. The roof gets glued into place with the same mix of tacky glue and hot glue. And while I've got it out, I place all of the doors and windows where I want them as well. I decided at this point that it still looked a little too box-like though, so I cut a few fake tops for the wooden pillars and glued them on, hoping to break up the structure a little bit. I also added a foam hatch to the roof balcony as well. This was all using the same methods I've already described, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail since this has already turned into a truly massive video for me. Okay folks, there we go. The structure is done on all three houses. Now if you've been watching you may notice that all three houses are going to require different painting styles as well. For this house, I really want to retain the natural color of the wood when I paint it, which means I can't use a spray primer. So I'm going to do a brush on primer over everything except the wood panels. Those I'm going to leave in their natural color and I'll bring those out with contrast paints or maybe with washes in the next step. Now for this one, I actually haven't even textured this house yet. That's actually going to be the last step that I do here. I'm going to use clay for the texture on the outside and I actually want to retain the natural color of the clay. I'm probably going to tint it with like an oil wash or something like that, but I don't want to paint over it. Now because of that, that means that I have to paint the rest of the house first before putting the texture on. It does have a mix of foam and resin and paper and other components, but because there's foam there, I'm going to use a foam safe spray paint to get the primer on it. And finally this one, which is almost entirely made of foam except for the few resin pieces on it. I was actually thinking about painting this one in Mod Podge, but because of those bright pink resin pieces, I really don't want to risk any of that color showing through. So I think that the foam safe spray paint may be the way to go here as well. I'm going to give that a try and just see where we land on it. So three buildings constructed, three different methods, now three different paint techniques. Why did I make this one video? What am I doing? Whatever, it's a lot of work, but let's just, let's go. I decided to start on this building first since once I put the clay texture on it's going to need a long drying time. And pretty much every detail of the building except the oil wash needs to be finished before I do that. So I base the roof panels in a simple acrylic craft red. Now this may take multiple coats if you're looking for full opacity. I did two coats and it's still a little blotchy but I'm actually okay with that since these buildings are supposed to be run down anyway. I start all of the wooden pieces with a medium brown overbrush, leaving some of the dark primer in the deepest cracks. This is going to start the process of getting some nice contrast on the wooden panels. I also base coat the stone window and door frames in a medium brown before going back through and picking out individual stones in different colors. I know I always say that stone can be pretty much any color, and then I proceed to paint it grey, but there's none of that here. All of these colors are leaning towards a warmer palette, warm browns with a lot of pink and orange mixed in. In fact, the color scheme for this entire city is very bright and warm, leaning into orange tones, so expect that throughout. The privacy curtain at the front door also gets a base coat of white. I've decided to just use a speed paint for the curtain, so it needs that light base to help pick up the details. I settled on Volupis Pink Speed Paint for this, a nice bright flash of color that still has those warm pink tones in it. I also quickly hit the inside wooden parts of the door frame with snakebite leather. 
It's a very yellow brown that works well with the warm colors I've been talking about. This goes on to the wooden window frames as well. With that done, it's time for a unifying dry brush. This is an off-white that goes over everything. All of the resin parts, the tile roof, the wooden roof supports, even the curtain gets a little bit. It might look a little too bright right now, but it's going to help bring the colors together, and after we wash it later, it will get tamped down a little. I also take this opportunity to use an old brush to splat some random brown colors onto the roof to help with making it look worn and decayed. I really just want about every step possible done before I texture this building, including most of the weathering. So this step will help make it look like the building is aged and has been standing unattended and uncared for for a very long time. The last step in the weathering is going to be some of my homemade black wash. This goes over everything, just like the dry brush. This will help give me deeper shadows on the roof and in the wood grain, but I feel like using a water-based wash on the clay would reactivate it, so this step has to be done before the clay texture goes on. Then I finally get to texture the building. I'm using Crayola Air Dry Clay, which normally is not a product I recommend. It's cheap, yes, but it also always, always cracks while it dries. Now those cracks can usually be fixed, granted, but it's an extra step that most other modeling clays don't have to deal with. However, that's exactly why I am using it here. I want it to crack. I'm going to take advantage of that flaw in the product to get a cool texture for the outside of the building. The clay gets smeared on with a generous helping of water to ease and smoothing it out and thinning it. It's a pretty messy process, and if you try this yourself, you'll want to be careful not to get clay on everything else you're crafting. Of course, if you wanted, then you could use tools for this. There are plenty of readily available, affordable sculpting tools out there, or if you have green stuff or milliput, you can even make your own sculpting tools. But you know me, I like to get in there and use my hands. And again, I really had no idea at this point if this would work. For all I knew, the clay was going to dry and just fall off in chunks or be too fragile to use. But I wanted to experiment. And this is what it looks like before I set it aside to dry. While that dries, I just move on to the next building. This building got a brush prime in black. I select a handful of different craft paints from my collection, all leaning into that warm color scheme I'm using. A brown, a yellow, a soft pink, and a desaturated orange. I pour out a generous amount of each one onto my palette and start applying them randomly with a bit of kitchen sponge. I wet blend the edges of the colors together as I go, and I let them blend on the palette and on the sponge as well. These tones, and any of the tones mixed between them, they're all going to work fine together and hopefully create a random weathered look like Roman concrete. I am careful around the wooden parts though, and actually come in after with an old brush to get in close to those, stippling in the paint rather than actually sponging it on. Now this may take multiple layers of paint if you want full opacity, since it's over black. But I'm actually fine with partial opacity here since it lends to the grubby, weathered feeling. And at the end of this step, here's what I end up with. The next step is a simple and easy one at least. I'm just painting skeleton horde contrast paint onto all of the wooden pieces. This helps to bring out the details and to age them as well. This is something that could be done with washes instead, however, if you don't want to use that much contrast paint. Just a strong brown wash or a mix of browns and greens depending on what's appropriate for your own setting. To add some detail and color to the building, I'm going to paint a colored stripe around it. I don't really get too precious about measuring this though, I simply pick two foam offcuts of different sizes and use those to trace guidelines for the stripe around the building. Once that's done, I pick out a bright color, in this case a kind of green, blue, or aqua, and just freehand it onto the building, following the guidelines. 
It doesn't have to be perfect, and this is good practice for painting in straight lines if you're not used to it. For this building, I chose a dark brown to base the door and window frames. I wanted a dark, rich color to bring some contrast to all of the bright poppy tones already on the building. Then just like before, I pick out some of the stones in random other tones. And I paint the wooden pieces with snakebite leather after giving them a white base coat. Then it's time for dry brushing. Just as with the last building, I pick a unifying off-white color and brush it over everything. The walls, the wooden pieces, doors and windows, all of it. This is both a simple step and an essential part of making all of those different textures pop while still looking like they belong together. This will get an oil wash later with everything else, but for now, we can set it aside and move on to the third building. I won't lie, folks, this is the one I was most worried about painting. It's also the one that I think turned out by far the best. Like when painting a mini, I decided to start with the deepest parts first, so that it would be easier to paint over any mistakes. This means beginning with the bricks. I'm coating everything in an orange-yellow color from P3 called Meaty Ochre. Yeah, really. Not many of the bricks will be staying this color, but I knew painting over black would take multiple layers of paint anyway, and I really wanted a warm undertone to everything. This helps with both. I know it looks a little wild right now, but trust me. And just as importantly, trust yourself when you're painting things like this. Experimenting is the only way to get better. Next I start picking out random bricks in brown, warm orange, and pink, and a very light glacier yellow. This process is easy, but time-consuming, so just take it slow. If you feel yourself getting frustrated with it, be sure to walk away from the project for a bit rather than take shortcuts that you're going to regret later. Once all of the bricks are painted in, I take some watered-down brown and white paints and just flick them onto the bricks randomly. You really want these to be watered down to an almost glaze-like consistency, very translucent. This will add speckling to the bricks, but it will also be subtle when it's dry. Don't worry if it looks a little bright at first. As the paints dry, they'll become more dull. Okay, so I genuinely have no idea if this next part's gonna work or not. It's not something I've done before, not a technique I'm familiar with, but I did say at the start of the video that I was going to be experimenting with different things, trying things out and seeing what works, I'm a little nervous, but at some point, you've just got a Leroy Jenkins. Let's go. I go back to my cheap Crayola air dry clay in my pot of water. Using a very generous amount of water, I smear this all over the bricks, making sure to press hard enough to get it deep into the cracks between them. There's no way to do that without getting clay over the bricks as well, of course. That's why the next step is coming in with a wet kitchen sponge and wiping off all of the excess clay. I just used gentle, repeated strokes until I'd gotten rid of most, but not all, of the clay on the surface of the bricks. Now this is definitely a messy process and has quite a few steps to it without a doubt, but I'm honestly so happy with how it turns out in the end that I'll definitely be using it more in the future. I might even have to buy more of this mediocre clay now that I finally have a good use for it. When that is finally all completed and the clay is drying, I move on to the next step, painting the stone or concrete structure over top of the bricks. This is an easy one. With the brick already lending it so much color and character, I just use progressively lighter shades of gray, covering less each time. I start with a heavy overbrush of a dark gray, then an overbrush of a mid-gray, and finally a dry brush of off-white. With some of our black primer still showing through, that gives us four layers of color, which adds nice depth. I follow a similar structure for painting the wood. After using dull, cool grays, I wanted to go back to warmer tones for the wood to help bring the warmth of the whole building up, so I start by coating the wood with raw sienna, 
which is a very orange-leaning shade of brown. I'm not looking for total opacity. The undercoat showing through will lend to the contrast. The next step is an overbrush of a medium brown. This was territorial beige craft paint, but any medium brown is fine. You want to cover the majority of the surface in this, leaving the raw sienna mostly as an undertone. And the final step on the wood, aside from the oil wash that comes later, is a very light beige dry brush to give us some proper highlights and to bring out all of that wood texture. As before, all of the resin pieces get a brushed on white base coat before getting a layer of contrast paint. Snake bite leather, once again. Now, there's a lot of cool grey on this building, so I want to make sure everything else is warm to offset that. And of course, once the contrast is dry, I come back in with a dry brush of off-white to help blend the resin pieces in with the foam pieces and to give them the same level of detail. Then it's just a matter of picking out the few metal details a couple of braces on the door frame, and the jewelry ring on top of the roof hatch. Oh, and I had to paint the inside of the box black too, so that you don't see bright Christmas red through the front door. And that finally brings us to the last step, oil washes. I was really afraid that using a regular water-based wash would ruin the clay by reactivating it. And I actually like how the clay turned out, the cracks and the micro fractures, they're a fun texture. So I mixed brown and yellow pigments with a lot of white spirit. I want the wash to be pale in this case, not dark and overwhelming. Just enough to stain the clay. Imagine my surprise when the oil wash got absorbed almost immediately. Which I should have seen coming, because of course it would. But it's not a big problem. I just used more of it and brushed it on over the whole surface. I make sure to catch the foam and the roof tiles as well before moving on to the next building. For the next one I use the same wash but I also add a little bit of black to it. Not much, just enough to darken it down a little. And once again this goes on everywhere. It's pretty pale so it's not going to obscure or harm the colors, just bring them together a bit and weather everything. And the last building gets the same exact treatment with the only difference being that I only dab it on parts of the exposed brick rather than covering all of it. Okay folks, that about does it for this build. I am actually super happy with how these turned out. Very hyped about it. Really couldn't be happier with this project. I am gonna get into the pros and cons of it, but before that, if you've come this far and you've enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe. And it, it, I know it took me a little longer to get this video out than previous ones to do the editing and just to build all of these buildings. So if this is the type of content you'd like to see more of, please let me know in the comments. It's the only real way that I have to gauge what you guys want to see and what's not interesting to you. So please let me know. Uh, of the three buildings, I think my favorite has to be the foam building. The detail in it is just, it turned out so well. And the technique of using the clay with the foam bricks, really enjoy that. Definitely gonna have to use that in future projects. I just love how it turned out. It does still look a little, you know, it looks like it looks boxy. It looks like it was based on a box. Uh, and it was. So, I mean, I guess that's fine. I might do something in the future to alleviate that a little bit, like maybe build a staircase up the side of the building to uh, as an alternate way to get up to the rooftop and just to break up that boxy look of it. Just do something to break that shape a little more. I'm not sure what that would be, but that's what bothered me with most of these buildings, actually, is that they more or less still look like they're based on boxes. Uh, the clay building, it was actually pretty easy to do, fun to work with. It stuck to the box pretty well. Uh, it does feel a little delicate, like maybe this building is not going to be around for that long. Um, I'm a little worried about bumping it against things or pieces of the clay falling off. I knew that was a risk when I tried it. 
not every risk pans out, right? But it looks good for now. I'm sure I can get enough time out of it to use it in my campaign. That's what really matters. Lastly is the texture gel building. Working with the wood and the texture gel was fun. It was easy. Unfortunately, I think this one is also the one that looks the most like a box sill. The sharp corners really sort of give it away. And while the rooftop patio and the texture help, it just ends up being the most box-like still to me, unfortunately. But hey, that's all right. All together, I think they look great. And they're gonna look good together in the city that I'm building and on the tabletop. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video and you would like to support the channel monetarily, there are links in the description below for how you can do that. Uh, there's one to buymeacoffee.com and there's also an Amazon wish list for things that I would like to showcase or use on the channel. Any support is hugely appreciated and I would like to thank everyone who has not only donated through those, which is amazing uh, and so flattering to me, I thank you so much, but also just everyone who watches, everyone who subscribes and hits like, thank you all. You're awesome and hopefully I'll see you on the next one.